Well, once again, the warmest of welcomes to our service of Holy Eucharist on this the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. My friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As, as we remain standing in God's presence, let us pray. Author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us in all goodness, and if your great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'd like you please to be seated as we listen attentively to God's word proclaimed. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Hear, O Lord, hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me and went after worthless things and became worthless themselves? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in the lands of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my inheritance an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, says the Lord. I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kadar and examine with care if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this and be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. The word of the Lord. So I 
The second reading is written in Hebrews 13, 1 to 8, and 15 and 16. A letter, a reading from the letter of Paul to the Hebrews. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such fr sacrifices are pleasing to God. The word of the Lord. Be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come to you and say, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You may have read of the uh, firestorm in Finland this past week.
Footage was leaked of their 32-year-old Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, dancing at a party. Now, the German magazine Das Bild had already dubbed her the coolest Prime Minister in the world. Opposition politicians, of course, pounced, questioning her discretion. Supporters of her are posting videos of themselves partying and dancing. It's just what normal people do, they say. Prime Minister Marin voluntarily undertook a drugs test to prove that she was clean. You know, that's the thing about social convention, isn't it? You often don't quite know where the line is until others tell you you've crossed it. <laughs> Pretty sure that Jesus knew he was crossing a line this morning. He didn't need anyone to tell him. Finds himself in the home of one of the Pharisaic top dogs on the Sabbath. And as you may know, the Sabbath meal was the fanciest of the week. Special food, smartest tablecloth, best crockery and cutlery. Other Jews would often have their neighbours and friends over and maybe a notable teacher or rabbi, which is perhaps how Jesus got his invite. We read that the Pharisees are watching him closely. They're suspicious. And maybe for good reason. As becomes evident, Jesus is not behaving himself. Right off the bat, he takes a run at those guests jockeying for the first couches at the dinner table. And then he tells his stunned host who to invite to his next meal. Imagine the Pharisees are shocked into silence. Who does this guy think he is? Now just a word about meals back in Jesus' day. Jesus lived in what we would call today an honor-shame culture. It was all about your standing in society back then. It wasn't as much about your wealth, although they were often linked, as it was about your honor. And nowhere, nowhere was your honor, your status, your standing more on display than at mealtime. Meals weren't just about eating. Meals were a way in which you made a powerful statement about who you were in society. There were all sorts of social rules woven into meals. Who gets invited, what, when, and where you eat, what order people sit down, and what is done and what is not done at the table. Typically, people only ate with those from the same social class. Guests of honor sat close to the host. Those less honored sat farther away. And the understanding was that if I invite you to dinner, then you're going to invite me back. I scratch your back and you scratch mine. In fact, guests would routinely turn down an invitation if they knew they weren't in a position to return the favor. Now, Jesus' first move this morning seems innocent enough. The one about not going for the head table at a wedding bash. Better to go for the peanut gallery and get invited up rather than risk being told at the head table to, to go and sit with the kids. I mean, that's social etiquette. Good manners. Common sense. And nothing peculiar to Jesus in naming this. There were verses in Proverbs which said much the same thing. Greek and Roman literature also advised the same counsel. In Jesus' day, as in ours, honor is generally something others give to you rather than something you appropriate to yourself. Just makes sense to go for the lower place. What sets Jesus' counsel apart is what he goes on to say. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves 
will be exalted. Or as the message puts it, if you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you content to simply be yourself, you'll become more than yourself. It's what literary critics call polar reversal. Christ's counsel this morning isn't just about good manners, it's about the flipping on its head of what we're told is important in life. What gets passed off as making for success. When north becomes south and south becomes north, the world gets upended. And the world, as Jesus knows only too well, doesn't like that. Only the Christ doesn't stop here. He goes on to give a concrete example of what this back-to-front way of doing life looks like in practice. And he does this not by addressing the guests, those invited to the banquet, rather he now has some words of advice to the host. And this time his counsel goes way beyond what might sound like good manners. Jesus takes a run, a straight run at this honor shame culture. We're keeping a record of things is everything. Status and honor, favors and debt. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. I put you in my debt by inviting you to dinner so that you'll then have to return the favor to me. As the message phrases Jesus' words to the host. The next time you put on a dinner, don't just invite your friends and family and rich neighbors, the kind of people who will return the favor. Invite some people who never get invited out, the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. You'll be and experience a blessing. Oh, they won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned and how, how it will be returned at the resurrection of God's people. Keeping account, part of that honor-shame culture back in Jesus' day for sure, I still find myself wondering how much it figures today in our lives. Seems like society needs us to know our place. Recall a preacher recounting her experience at the airport she arrived early for her flight, and there was nobody, nobody at any of the check-in counters. The first counter she approached was for business class passengers. And even though there was no one else there, anywhere, the airline clerk politely told her that she needed to go back and wind her way backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards through the check-in lines to get to the economy counters. I mean, it made no difference for her checking in. It was simply that the airline was keeping her count and needed her to know where she belonged. Jesus' way is different. It isn't about who belongs where. He's not interested in social payoff. He doesn't calculate the return on the hospitality that he offers. As David Lowe's notes, his whole life is about inviting people into God's loving presence, those who neither expect it nor, frankly, deserve it. And he wants the same from us. He challenges us to throw away the social calculator, to stop counting the costs, the benefits, the rewards of what we do, and simply to live from the sense of abundance with which God has blessed us. Girls came into church with me on Tuesday morning. Lynn was teaching in St. Kitts. We, we picked our way over broken glass, a needle and pieces of tinfoil on our 
back walkway just out here. It's been a not infrequent occurrence over the past weeks. Well, when the girls asked, I explained that the glass was from a crack pipe, which people use to smoke a dangerous street drug called crystal meth. The needle and tinfoil were likely used with another really bad drug we call heroin. Derek's been cleaning up far too much of that paraphernalia lately. Derek tells me there are dealers now living nearby on Houston with a steady stream of clientele. The heartbreaker for me was driving past that same house later in the day and seeing kids, young kids, playing in the alley alongside the house. And that sparked a conversation with Sophie and Felicity about kids not getting to choose their parents, nor their homes, nor the environment in which they're raised. And I heard Sophie saying under her, her breath from the back seat, we're so blessed. You know, we spend so much of our time counting. Whether it's how much time we have left, or what's in our bank account, or what others think of us. I'm guessing it's partly because we live in this culture that's constantly trying to persuade us that we don't have enough. Not enough time, not enough money, not enough youth, not enough resources, not enough recognition. You name it. We hear incessantly that we need more of something. But what if there is enough and more than enough? What difference would it make to our peace of mind and especially to how we respond to the overwhelming need of our neighbours here in Jamesville? Would we start to see those kids just living across the street less as competitors for scarce resources whether it's social support or money or time? Could we begin to see them more as Christ sees them? As those for whom he came? As those whom he has adopted as his own kin? As those with whom he longs to share the abundance of God's love and grace? Perhaps that's something of what Jesus is getting at this morning when we find ourselves hung up on social convention and doing the math. He wants to share with us his freedom of not worrying about what others think or say, of not figuring out what we hope to get in return. He calls us simply to welcome, to host those around us, and especially those who may not have a whole lot of experience of being welcomed or being hosted. He invites us to shower upon them the extraordinary gifts of dignity and worth and value with which God has already so richly blessed us. this upside down, back to front, inside out way of Christ's reign, which we here at 252 James North bear witness to. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
We confess the faith of our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take your favored prayer posture as we gather together as God's community. Our response today after loving God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for your church that we can show how to share the good things God, that you wish us to give the world. In particular, we pray now for our siblings and our communities around the world. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Polynesia. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, we pray for Bishop Kathy Martin, the people and rostered ministers of the British Columbia Synod. In the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for the Right Reverend Chris Harper, Bishop, and the clergy and people of the Diocese of Saskatoon. In our own Diocese of Niagara, we pray for our Bishop, the Right Reverend Susan Bell, St. John the Evangelist Winona, and the Reverend Antonio Ilias, Rector, and the Reverend Paul Whitehouse, assistant priest, and the people of that parish. And we pray for our own parish here, for Dean Tim, and for Jeff, and for all the honorary assistants, and for this whole community. Loving God, in your mercy. Let us pray for the nation and for all in authority that those who hold responsibility recognize that they do have that responsibility and that they collaborate in making decisions for the well-being of the whole community and especially those in need. Loving God, in your mercy. Yeah. Let us pray for the whole world and especially remembering those areas that are experiencing war such as Ukraine and Libya, or the climate change disasters, today particularly remembering Pakistan. Loving God, in your mercy. In our community, we pray for the coming elections. Many elections will be happening across our land. And we pray for those who are running for office that they do so with kind hearts to serve their communities and respond to the needs of those communities. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in need and are sick. And we remember especially those who have asked for our prayers in our community. Susan Andrews, Gary Hanna, Sally and Willow Braun Jackson, Selena Leong, Heather Glass, Norm Foley, Veronica, Carol Nixon, Laura, Colin Campbell, Janet, Sarah McPherson, Donnell DeFlaming, Jonathan James, and Russell Bradley. Help us to have the courage also to work for decent and affordable housing for our neighbors, for they are truly in need. Loving God, 
In your mercy, hear our prayer. We also continue to remember those who have died, for those who are known to us alone, and we continue to pray for the repose of the souls of Canon Dr. Fred Hall, Anne McPherson, and the Reverend James Stiles. We pray also for their loved ones, especially our own Canon Sharon Hall and Sarah McPherson and all their families, that they may be upheld by God's loving embrace at this time of grief and remembrance. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we thank you for calling us the body of Christ together this day. We thank you that you have given us all we need. All that we need is in you. And when we share it with others, we are blessed. We are your hands in this world. And we thank you for the ministry you give us to share your love in the whole world. Be with us now and always. Amen. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, go and be reconciled. As siblings in God's family, we come together to ask our compassionate God for forgiveness. <coughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd like you please to stand as you are able. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. As best we can, we exchange the peace with those around us.
standing we pray. Merciful God, receive all we offer you this day. Give us grace to love one another, that your love may be made perfect in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants Abraham and Sarah, gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. 
Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now as our Saviour has taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. My friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As is our custom here, we'll have two lines for communion in the centre aisle. If you would like to receive bread only, I invite you to form a line on the, uh, my right, your left, of the centre aisle. And if you want to receive in both kinds, both bread and wine, if you'd please form a line on your left, uh, my left, your right, of the centre aisle. Thank you.
I invite you please to stand as you are able. Almighty God, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May your holy food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated briefly for our announcements. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were in St. Catharines, St. Thomas St. Catharines, uh, to celebrate uh, the life and witness of Anne McPherson, Sarah's mum, and I want on your behalf to thank very much the number of choristers, choir members, who made the trip down to St. Catharines to support Sarah and her family in what was a gorgeous liturgy. So, uh, Bruce, thank you. Where's Bruce gone? He's probably scurried out. Well, thank you very much for organising the choir and uh, thank to all those choristers who were present yesterday afternoon. Whilst on the subject of funerals, uh, uh, Dr. F uh, Frederick Albert Hall's funeral will be here on Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock, of course known to us as our beloved Fred. Uh, there'll be visitation from 1.30 to 2.30, service here at three, and, uh, and then a reception to follow. I'm expecting it to be quite a large service, so uh, just please bear that in mind if you're planning on attending. And please, if you would keep Canon Sharon and Matthew and Elliot and their respective families in your prayers uh, through this week. Just a quick save the date that you'll see in, your, in the Chronicle, uh, September the 24th, when we will be, uh, the, or the Cathedral Crusaders will be walking the waterfront trail in support of PWRDF, uh, um, with a particular focus on refugees and internationally displaced persons. So again, September 24th, just to hold the date there. And I'm looking down at Seanica um, and uh, Seanica Thomas, uh, just back from New Zealand actually. I think it was nine months you had in yeah, the best, part, best place in the world, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, not really. And uh, Seanica, you're back, but only briefly because you're heading off to Bangladesh to serve in a refugee camp. Um, uh, you've trained at midwifery. Um, I'm not sure whether that's what you'll be doing there or not, you will be doing midwifery there. So, um, God bless you. And you know that you go with the uh, thoughts and prayers of this community and uh, we'll pray for all that you need and more in, uh, 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 in order to discharge whatever responsibilities are entrusted to you. I think you're going with um, uh, Médecins Sans, Sans Frontières, MSF, a good organization. And so I'm praying especially that you'll be really well looked after. And we can't wait to hear about your experiences when you, when you get back. God bless you. Uh, the only other piece of news, and um, this is a really happy, some really happy news to share. Uh, I'm just delighted to announce the appointment of a new parish coordinator. Yeah, Tricia uh, Kanantari is a lifelong Anglican. She happens to be married to the Reverend Barman Kalantari, who is rector of Our Saviour the Redeemer in Stony Creek. Uh, she coordinates Sunday school there. She has worked for 16 years in the travel industry, uh, which has included stints of managing a busy consultancy office. She's just wonderful. Uh, God has really blessed us, and I'm hoping when she starts that we can show her the kind of warmth of cathedral welcome that you've shown, uh, shown me for the, to our family as well. So she starts on September 19. Um, so please be upholding Tricia and Barman uh, in your prayers as, uh, as she prepares to come and join our ministry team. Really excited about that. Anything? Oh, yes. You're, yeah, just as well you're there, Sandy. I'm, Thank I may you. have forgotten. Yeah. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, John, uh, Paul, John Watts about Supercrawl. I feel this is a bit like the bands of marriage. This is the second time of asking, and John will perform the third time of asking next week. In the second reading today, it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. We are opening our doors during Supercrawl on the Friday evening, most of Saturday, and also on Sunday afternoon. 
we have quite a few people signed up for Friday and also Sunday afternoon. So Saturday is our time of greatest need. And I shall not ask if any of you have just cause or impediment to stop you doing this, but rather I would simply ask you, please help. Thank you. There is a sign-up sheet, sorry, there's a sign-up sheet at the back in the north at Narthex. Thank you, Sandy. Very apropos in light of the readings this morning. Nothing else? I invite you then please to stand as you are able. The God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish, strengthen, and settle you in the faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier be among you and remain with you always. Amen. forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. <laughs>